everybody, this is Brian O'Haran, and this is the ninth program in the series, Planning for Success. Today's program is dedicated to my grandfather, Carmel Russo. He was born in Syracuse, Italy, and became an apprentice barber at the age of seven. In about 1910, he moved to Conspicua Malta, where he married my grandmother, and my mother was born. My grandfather came to America in steerage alone and took up the barber's trade in Torrington, Connecticut. He never saw his parents again. He saved his hard-earned money for two years to enable my mother and grandmother to join him in America. He had eight children in all, five that lived, and the children used to split an orange during the Depression. During the Second World War, people called him a greenhorn and threw garbage on his lawn. But he never gave up. He saved his money and provided well for his family. And before he died, he had quite an amount of savings. He was a very professional businessman who looked and acted like a banker. He never talked religion, politics, or controversial subjects to his customers. His customers always came first. He would never close the barbershop on a Saturday because that was his big revenue day and he didn't want to lose the customers. He never took a holiday. He didn't take a holiday because he was afraid the customers may go somewhere else and then not come back. All of my, his daughters, my aunts, were married on a Monday because he didn't want to close the barbershop on a Saturday. When I was a child, I never knew it was a Monday because it was a very festive occasion and I thought it was Saturday. If one of his customers was ill, he would walk to their home, he never owned a car, and he would give them a free haircut. If one of his customers was ill in the hospital, he would walk to the Charlotte Hungerford Hospital and give them a haircut. When they passed away, he would walk to the funeral home and give them their last haircut. As he grew older and retired, he lived to be about 85, he would walk to his old customers' homes and give them haircuts over the years. When I was in university, I think it was my sophomore year, I received a check from my mother for $250. And I asked her, what was this money? Where did it come from? She said, it came from your grandfather. When you were born, I was the first grandchild in the family. When you were born, he bought an insurance policy and he saved nickels, dimes, and quarters over the years by paying the premiums. And the total amount now is $250. He never mentioned this to me till the day he died, although I did thank him for it. customer satisfaction from my grandfather and I practiced the art all of my working career. I have been Mr. Kratis satisfaction, customer satisfaction for two major computer companies over the years. In memory of my grandfather, I will now play a few bars of an old Sicilian air that is now the basis for the song Home Sweet Home. <laughs>
Thank you, Grandfather. Well, if you don't think that was an emotional experience, try it sometime. Very difficult for me to get through that, and it's very emotional even now. I have a cold, pretty bad cold, but as I learned from my friends in Hollywood and New York, show must go on. So I'm here to try to get through the next hour, despite the cold. I've got a few medications here, and I've got a glass of water, and I think I might be able to make it. I will start again, as usual, with the agenda. And I'll talk, first I'll talk about a few comments. Then I'll have the financial update, a major project the status board that I created now that the election's over, a major decision status board that I created now that the election's over, and we'll keep up to date from week to week, and a quick review of planning for success uh, to date for those especially who haven't watched it in the past, a quick review of creating an organization for success, a quick review of creating an environment for success part one, and then finally after these last three or four weeks we'll get to creating an environment for success part two, and then next week we'll talk a bit about expediting the solution. Now I'll make some comments and then we'll get, we'll, we'll move on from there. The bond package has promised um, well, actually, this isn't what I wanted to do next. What I want to do next was the comments. So let me see if I can find the comments. Okay. The comments are Veterans Day tribute to uh, William R. McGrain, my great-great-grandfather. My great-grandfather will be a picture up on the board today of his 50th wedding anniversary. He was an Orangeman from Armagh and Carney Armagh in Ireland. I had orange hats on, although you won't be able to see the hats. They had oranges in their hands. Or orange men, and my grand, great, my grandfather, great grandfather's in there. My grandfather's in there. My father's in there as a child, probably four or five years old. My cousins and my father's cousins and my grandmother's in there, and all kinds of people. Uh, right off to my, facing me, off to my right shoulder there is my grandfather, uh, with his orange hat on and uh, the mustache. He's the guy that was in. Came over from Ireland and uh, volunteered for the Civil War and was a combatant soldier there. Uh, so I thank him for that and all the rest of the veterans who have been in combat over the years. Um, yesterday was Veterans Day, so thanks for that. Next thank you is for getting us off to, uh, to all the citizens of the town who voted, for getting us off to a fine start by electing five very seasoned businessmen to manage our town for the next two years. We have turned the triangle around. Hopefully now we begin to, to travel down the triangle instead of up the triangle. Um, we have been received well and we are off to a great professional start. I'd like to thank all the candidates, all the people who helped the candidates, particularly Heather Capabianca and um, her husband David for putting in so much time and helping these Republicans to get into office. There's a special thanks also to the Taxpayers Association and the Independent Party and the under, unaffiliated candidate for their endorsement and support of, the, of some of these candidates. And I would also like to thank the many members of the Democratic Party that expressed encouragement and support and those that voted for the candidates that won the election from, from both parties. Today begins my personal campaign to convince you to bring us seven very seasoned businessmen in the 09 election. That, that campaign starts today. I'll show you how I'm going to approach that. Next week, I will be having my program switch to 9 o'clock on Tuesday evenings, and they will continue until further notice um, at that time. 9 p.m. on Tuesday evenings from 9 to 10 planning for success. I will continue to help the selectmen as much as practical by gathering statistics, helping to draft objectives, helping to create progress reports whenever I can be of help. I will also continue to give status to the taxpayers and the residents of the town on 
the financial news and also on the progress of these elected officials. That way next year, or in two years, we'll be able to tell right away who we want to vote for, hopefully. <laughs> Because this program is well, so well received, I'll re, I'll, I have arranged for the better time slot. People are dropping some of these shows that were on before the election, so some time slots are available. I must say, though, that when I first got the 5 to 6 on Monday, I was a little skeptical about it, but we've had a real good reception and response from the community, and I'm tickled pink with that. So it turned, all turned out for the better in the end, and, and as long as I feel I can contribute, I will continue. Now for the financial news, if we can f switch now to the slide. <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is the bond package, and that's the, um, as promised, the majority uh, of selectmen have canceled the public meeting and referendum dates for the new bond package. They will now concentrate on a new proposal more in line with their campaign promises, at least the, ma the majority of five. I tend to, to deal with news here that's already in the public domain. I have no inside information, so uh, I can't tell you what's going to happen here on that. But if you watch uh, um, Jay Case's show um, on uh, Thursday evenings, then uh, you might get into some information there, or if there's any other shows on during the week by the Democrats or anybody else, maybe you'll get some information there. But anyway, uh, and then next Monday or uh, when I, next next week when I'm on it on uh, Tuesday evening, then I'll probably have better information for you on how they intend to proceed. I know that they're going to try to look at the most critical needs first, especially the ADA and OSHA considerations for Pearson School. The voting was five in favor and one against and one in abstention. Over the year or two, if I'm still here to do it in, the, in that time, um, I will keep a track of how many unanimous votes we have and who abstains and who votes no and who votes yes on what issues. And I'll probably every quarter I'll produce a status report, which I'll show on this program. The reevaluation results property revaluation results are due early December. So that's the next financial uh, impact we will see. And I'm glad that will be in December because then we'll know uh, before we, we vote on any bonding for any of the other issues. Now here's the first major status report. Red means it's done <clears throat> and blue means it's in process. And as they get upgraded, I will put red on there when, they, when they're complete. And when new ones get started, I will put blue on. There's probably more started than I know here. But until the information is out in the public, I can't really deal with it. So uh, the first thing that happened, a major step forward for the town. And you should be very, very proud of yourself for voting this way. You've elected five major uh, uh, businessmen as selectmen. Now, we also have Candy Perez, who is an educator, and we have uh, uh, Mike Renzullo, who is yet undetermined, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the jury's out there, but uh, I talked to uh, one or two of his relatives who say he does have some business experience. He's built a few homes, and he's trying to either has them sell, sold or is selling them, and uh, got back recently from university in, in Colorado. So I have hopes for, I hopes for him, and I did drop off at his... Uh, father's office today, a list of my um, um, problems uh, uh, in, Winst in Winstead and in in my proposed alternative, which is the objectives that I talked about on this show. Um, it's the uh, uh, paper I produced on the possible objectives for success. Number two, establish and publish high-level business priorities. I know that's in the works and that should be published pretty quick. We talked about that on the show before, so they will agree and produce five high-level uh, business priorities. And then these are the other commitments that they made during the campaign, as far as I know. And uh, these are mainly on this page the organizational type commitments that they made. Uh, there may be more. If uh, some pop up, I'll put them on here, but we're going to keep track of them and we're going to watch progress as we go along to see exactly what uh, they do. 
And uh, they said they would delegate authority. They're going to try to change the charter to make it more uh, e easy to run as a business. Um, they're going to produce, try to produce the five-year financial plan objectives in a five-year financial plan. And they're going to review and make decisions necessary on a quarterly basis. Now, that was committed to before the election. So there are no details are yet. There are no time frames, but we will keep an eye on it. And let me just, again, once say that even if they don't change the charter and they don't do everything the way I'm saying, this is Brian's view of how a business should be run, maybe not necessarily everybody else's, but that won't be the end of the world. It'll really slow the process down. It'll make it very difficult to get anything done. And uh, it won't, uh, it won't um, help us in the long run, but it, we still got to plot along and try to make everything happen. So we'll do that. Now, I want to say once again that when I talked about changing the charter, I thought it was very important to take and have the selectmen in instead of for two years, for four years, so they would have time to do the job. It's going to take us quite a few years to get out of the pickle we're in, and it isn't going to be done overnight. So um, we need these people to stay in. So as a backup plan, just in case the charter doesn't get changed the way I would like to see it get changed, because a lot of people tell me they probably won't make it that way, but I am going to try to see if I can um, give you enough information so in two years you'll keep the good people in and elect better people in the place of the people that you don't think are carrying their share of the load over the next two years. So we got to have a backup plan and that's my backup plan. We always got to have a backup plan. Next thing I want to put up is the importance decision status board and that'll be up every week, um, <clears throat> especially when changes are made or additions or when things get complete or get into the blue progress area. Uh, these are decisions more than uh, organizational things. These are uh, like we did, stop the proposed bond meeting, pro stop the proposed bond referendum, review the content of the proposed bond and proposal, restructure. These are things that were committed to before the election. Resolve the Pearson ADA and OSHA infractions. I think that has to be done by July of next year, but I'm not positive. Uh, we'll let you know next week for sure on that. Um, Resolve Pearson, I'm um, sorry, resolve recreation director as soon as practical. Some of these things can't be done right away because it th does take money from somewhere to, to be able to do these things. So that has to be looked at. Uh, the budget has to be looked at by the new selectmen. Uh, resolve part-time fire marshal as soon as practical. Resolve part-time building inspector as soon as practical. These were commitments that were made. And uh, a very, very important one, and we'll talk more about that tonight, <clears throat> if, we, if I can make it through here with my cold, is to transfer the, uh, well, the res resolve the part-time building inspector, if I haven't said that, as soon as practical. And then the most important one is to transfer the school building maintenance responsibility, uh, the school building maintenance and, the, and maintainers and everybody else, uh, and a budget to the town of Winchester as soon as practical. Now everybody seems to be in favor of this. I think there are some problems to be worked out with the uh, <clears throat> with uh, representatives of the uh, bargaining units and things like that that have to be resolved. And I can't even guarantee that'll happen. But the, they're going to put their best efforts into trying to. And I'm not speaking for the whole board of selectmen here. This was committed to by the by, by the Republican Party, but. Uh, to transfer the school building maintenance responsibility and all that's very important because once that's done then what happened in the past 10 years uh, where, where the money was being given in the budget supposedly and the people weren't spending it on, fi on the maintenance well that won't happen in the future that'll be the town's responsibility so the, the budget won't you won't be able to switch the money from maintenance uh, to other things like teacher salaries or books or anything else well, that would be much more accountable. And, and the school people can then deal with the, what I call the education issues, not have to worry about the building maintenance and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's a big step forward, and the quicker that happens, the better. And I know we're going to see a blue mark there sooner or later that that's being worked on. Can't tell you when. Now I want to <clears throat> start a brief review of um, some of the past programs especially for we we have a lot more people watching now and some of you that were watching might have maybe lost a little perspective during the last election month of uh, uh, razzmatazz but uh, so here we go in uh, just a short review this is why we set up this program 
<clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> planning for success. Number one, to identify the problem, which I think we did quite rightly, that the problem is that we're breaking even over the last 10 years, and uh, we, we don't seem to be getting ahead, and it's hard for us to finance things like the maintenance of the buildings and new, and new buildings and things like that as we stand now. Uh, re, uh, proposed required solutions, main propose, proposal we made was to try to get the revenue up. And in, in, in the Republican uh, pre-election promises, campaign promises, they said they, put, they would put getting new revenue in as a top priority. So I'm waiting to see that uh, um, put into effect by them. Um, it isn't just the revenue, by the way, because as you saw from my last programs, uh, we're not going to get a big jump in the revenue real quick. Um, we're, uh, we're going to get uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work has to happen and plans put into place, people motivated, et cetera, et cetera, before we started. So it's going to take years to get the revenue up. It's, going to happen. it's not going to happen overnight. So if you can switch to this slide, I'd appreciate it here. Okay, thank you. And then I can blow my nose. Thanks. <laughs> A heck of a cool. All right. The next is um, provide the organization for success. Thank you for doing that last week. Now I think we have what we, in place what we need as selectmen and the majority to be able to, to do this. And I'm hoping that the minority selectmen also play uh, manage along with us and that it's all done harmoniously. But if not, we need to get it done. The object of the exercise here is not, not to all be happy working together. It's all be happy working together getting the right things done. So uh, I hope it's all done in a business-like manner and that we proceed. So uh, next is providing the environment for success, and we talked a bit about that. A few changes to the charter and, um, and uh, things like that are necessary. We certainly need to have the charter changed or the implementation of a five-year business plan for the town. We don't have one right now, and we need one. So that's critical whether we change the charter to do it or we do it without changing the charter. My recommendation is change the charter get that in there. And uh, a lot of people are afraid if we change the charter, we'll also stop things from going to referendum. I don't think we should do that, but that's not my decision. The new selectmen can decide and they can uh, work out a plan for that. And then beginning, uh, we're going we're gonna to finish Environment for Success today. <coughs> and then we're going to introduce, uh, next week we're going to talk about necessary disciplines and things and uh, other uh, expediting the solution. Now, I want to say that uh, this approach we took here for the total of the town, mm -hmm. we also do it when we solve individual problems. For example, getting the grades up in the school, we should set some objectives for that. Um, getting the cost down per average student, uh, or getting more students to, to get the cost down per average student, or whatever way we choose to do it, we should set some objectives for that over the years. And then we should put plans together. That's in my green papers. You can go see that in... Uh, in a town hall, if you uh, wish. Um, okay, now we did talk about organizing for success, and I already mentioned some of that already. Uh, we talked about creating the environment for success part one, which was to review the charter and to provide the five year business plan. Now we're going to talk about the new stuff, and that is creating an environment for success part two, right? And creating for uh, uh, an environment for success part two mainly deals with three or four basic uh, things that we need to achieve. The first is the Board of Education. I'd like to remind you that the Board of edu the uh, school budget for the town <coughs> is 63 or 4 percent of our budget. No business can run satisfactorily without concentrating on its biggest area of expense, which is the school system. 64% of our tax dollars go there. We get about $10 million, $8.5 .8 million from the state to help. And uh, if something should happen there and we don't get that money, then we've got a bigger problem than we have right now that won't be healthy. So I want to make a couple suggestions here for the new team. And one is <clears throat> that the chairman of the Board of Education should be occupied by a person with business experience. And the reason I say that is because we have a business problem there. Most of the problems are business problems, not education problems. 
I'm not totally sure of the three job descriptions. I'm going to try to find out in the next week or two between the chairman of the Board of Education and the, uh, the other two important positions there, superintendent of schools and the financial director. But I want to go over there in the next few weeks and talk to them and try to understand that. But I do basically think that the chairman of the board should be a person with business experience because we have a business problem there. And we have plenty of people there who can help us with the education aspects. We can hire consultants for that. We got people on the Board of Education who are very good and have a lot of experience with that. But our main problem is a business problem. And we need to take that bull by the horns. It's our problem. It's not the state's problem. It's not the union's problem. It's our problem. So what we have to do is decide what sort of education do we want our children to have? <clears throat> How can we, it's got to be one of course that we can afford and then we have to set some objectives for this education we want our people to have as a town and then we have to go implement that. So we know in the past that we've had problems with the test scores. I've talked to Blaze about it, Blaze Salerno, superintendent of schools, I think he's making progress there, and I think he'll continue to make progress. But what I'd like to see are some objectives. What have the test scores been over the last 10 years on average? How much have they been improving? And what are our targets for the next five years? And these are measurable targets. They're things that we can measure. And they come from statistics and fact. And then from planning for the future. So we have to set some objectives and then we have to put plans together as a town and we have to finance those plans and then we have to achieve those plans. And the second goes, as I mentioned earlier in the program, the second goal is the big, a big question in the town has been the cost per, average cost per student. Now we do know, and I'm not an ex expert in this area, I'm just trying to, as a citizen that watches a lot of these things and keeps an eye on and asks a lot of questions as an analyst, we seem to have a little bit of a problem in the area of um, cost per average cost per unit of, 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 for average cost per student because areas like Heartland are not sending people to our schools anymore. And when they don't send people to our schools and they go elsewhere, then we have less kids in the school, therefore the average cost per training these students, unless the budget is managed wisely, will go up not necessarily go up, I mean, but um, if, that, if the badges, budgets aren't managed, then I'm not saying they're not being managed wisely. Maybe we'll all come to the conclusion they are, and there's nothing we can do to improve them. I have my doubts there because I think I, I know some issues myself that could probably be improved. But what we need to do is say, what are we as a town, what can we afford, and what are we willing to afford to be able to, to train uh, children? I don't know if I mentioned this on previous shows. I think I did mention it way back. This is number nine now, so I'm beginning to forget one and two. But in my household, I always knew I wasn't going to be able to afford to go to Hotchkiss or one of the best prep schools. Matter of fact, when I got to the college, I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to the most expensive college in the country. I didn't have the grades to get a scholarship, which in those days you could do. I don't think you can even do that anymore for an uh, academic scholarship. But um, So I had to say, where can I afford to go? And I picked Kansas University because it was $50 a semester, including student fees, hospital costs, and everything. $50 a semester. Now in those days, $50 was a lot more than it is today. But that was something that I could afford to do and that I could afford to uh, work my way through. And as you know from today's uh, program, that my granddad gave me a little help, my mom and dad gave me a little help, eventually paid them back for that. But I had to make that decision. Now in those days people thought you were nuts if you went to Kansas University or any other state universities. Um, the Ivy League was the thing. But today, as you know, 
doesn't make that much difference. All the schools are excellent. And to go to the school is, uh, that you can afford is very important. So we have to decide for our own town, what is it we can afford? And I don't, I'm not going to make that decision. You are. It's whatever you can afford. But you certainly can't have schools that you can't afford. So my, my approach to that is let's get some more money in so we can afford them. And let's work at all. all uh, let's work at it. And let's get what we want and what we need. And let's solve the problem. But we need to set some objectives for that because there is no flood of money coming in over the next few years. I think personally, because I'm a businessman, that the board of directors should be reduced in numbers, if possible. I think there's nine people on that board. I talked to you earlier on a show, one shows about producing camels, and that my view is, the business view is that committees, large committees produce camels, <laughs> and we don't want any camels. We don't live in the Mideast. So we really should have a smaller board <clears throat> that can work, make decisions and get on with it. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, to be honest with you, because people tell me that there's a state requirement that we have nine people on the board, and if that's a state requirement, <clears throat> it's going to be very difficult to change it. So we're going to have to live with what we've got. And that way we need to get the business manager in to speed up that whole thing, get control of it, and uh, work better with the selectmen and with the Gilbert School and, uh, and uh, make this into a, a better situation. The next thing I put down, which I just touched on, was our relationship with the Gilbert School. As you know, we've had a lot of people in town who went to the Gilbert School. A lot of them went to a different Gilbert school because they probably went either before the Gilbert money ran out or uh, in the earlier days. And I know when I was a kid in Torrington, we looked up to the Gilbert school. They had excellent discipline, they produced excellent people, and they were highly respected in the area. Not that Torrington I wasn't, it was too. But nobody looked down on the Gilbert School, and I don't think they do to this day. You produced a man here who ran for president of the United States three or four times. When I went to the selectman meeting and the Board of Education with my green papers, and I even mentioned it in the green papers, the Gilbert School has produced a candidate for the president of the United States. When he came to town in his last campaign to talk at the library, five or six people showed up. If I were a civics teacher in town, and he came to town, I'd make sure my whole civics class was there. And I would say, look, we might not agree with his views. Maybe he won't even make a good president. But this guy came from our school. He read half the books in the library. And he went off to very good schools. And he did a lot for the country um, in a very successful way. So you can learn from that as students. And maybe you can someday run for, run for president. The other fine example that I have, and I don't know too many of the people who went through Gilbert School because I didn't, David Halberstam, one of the most famous authors in the world. Very positive person. Recently passed away, I'm sorry to hear. But he was in the same class as Ralph. So he, he was very, very good and uh, was a product of that Gilbert School. So I would like to see the relationship with the Gilbert School. The selectmen should continue to work with the Board of Education and Gilbert in an effort to understand each other's advantages and concerns and resolve any difficulties in a business-like manner for everyone's benefit. And I think that can happen. I think it's starting to happen already. There have been a lot of pressures. There have been a lot of bad press about it. We should stop that. We, as town members, should try to minimize the bad press about everything in this town. And we should all try, to the best of our ability, to maximize the good publicity about the good things in the town and how well it's going and how well we're working together and uh, how well our products are, how good our products are. So the next thing I want to point out is 
<coughs> pardon me. The fourth estate. For those who don't know what it is, the fourth estate is the newspapers and maybe other mass uh, information technology today. But our public relations can be greatly improved. And in order to attract new business to town, whether they be companies or, deve or uh, developments or whatever, We need to have good publicity. We need to be thought of as a very good place to live with an excellent school system. When I did talk to one of the past president, directors of the uh, development committee, as I mentioned on the show previously, he told me the first question they ask is, what are the test scores? What's the quality of the schools? So we need to be able to produce <coughs> positive information and disseminate it, disseminate it widely and as an orchestra send out the same message consistently to everybody. Whether they ask a person on the street or they have an article in the paper, the answer should always be the same, positive and good and we should work together for that. So we need to improve our interface with the press Maybe we can appoint someone to interface with the press and, like a company would and give a coherent, positive, and consistent, yet truthful impression of Winchester. You can't close out the press. We have free press in America. But they can give a positive, truthful impression of Winchester and Winston to the outside world. And we need to work at that, our public relations. The press should not be used as a weapon by one faction in the town against another. Because when you start throwing mud around, it lands on everybody. So to the extent it's being done now, it should be stopped. And in order to create an environment for success, we need to stop any of this, and we need to deal in a positive manner with the press. The next point I'd like to make is use of attorneys. I've been here now quite a few years watching the town in action. And I think we totally overuse attorneys. And I'm not talking just from a monetary viewpoint. But we should, the town should assume more risk like a business would. Businesses assume a lot of risk. I have a lot of risk. If somebody goes on my, and you have a lot of risk, if somebody goes on our property, and falls and breaks their leg, then, you know, we're reliable. And you can't say the person shouldn't have been on the property and all kinds of things because in the end, <clears throat> probably the insurance company will come in and say, we're going to pay them off. It's cheaper to do it that way. <clears throat> so uh, we all have risk. We, we take out risk insurance if we're smart and can afford it. But we all have that sort of Damocles hanging over our head. <clears throat> the town is no different. The town should assume more risk. The use of attorneys should not be used as a delaying device or a weapon against others. We should not be overly concerned about the legal implications of every decision. Attorneys should be used to help us achieve our ends. We should find ways to legally get things accomplished, not to legally slow things down. Attorneys should be told, this is what we want to achieve. Please help us find a way to expeditiously achieve our goals. Now, I will tell a quick story here <clears throat> about the man who taught me about how to use attorneys when I was very young in business and I was dealing with very big complex computer systems for major companies throughout the world Phil Fellows and what Phil Fellows used to say to me Brian it's the managers responsibility to create an environment for success where everybody can work 
efficiently and effectively. And he said, when you deal with the customers, at the time I was with a manufacturer, when you deal with customers for these huge systems that cost hundreds of millions of dollars in those days, that was a lot of money. You should get in and be fair, and you should produce a contract that the both sides will feel comfortable with, be able to live with, and be able to achieve their goals. And then you should take the contract and put it in the bottom drawer of your desk and forget about it. And you should get in with a customer and do everything you can within your power to make this venture a success. And then when it's over and it's successful, you can sit down and have a look at the contract and sort out any differences. But that's the kind of mentality that I was taught. So um, I think we need to do a little bit of more, more of that, right? Now, and I, by the way, that's how I ran things all over the world that way. So um, attorneys are essential, you need attorneys, and uh, you need to be able to relate to them and use their expertise. But you, we, the town, are in control. We, the town, are the ones that are using these experts, and we, the town, are the people that have to take some risk and get on with the job. I have some very good examples of that from my own experience in town that I may relate in future programs, but now is not the time for that. The next point I want to make is relationships with labor unions. This may be a tricky area. I apologize if anybody uh, feels uncomfortable talking about labor unions, but we do need to talk about labor unions because everywhere I've ever been, I've dealt with labor unions as, as, uh, as a business, part of the business. I've dealt with socialistic labor unions in socialistic countries. I've been in countries where the country was the union. Russia, for example, behind the Iron Curtain, Budapest, Hungary, um, East Germany, all those places. The government was the union. Now, where, in where town employees are represented by labor unions, it is important that both the town and the bargaining units realize the present state of affairs and continue to work together to harmoniously resolve differences for good of both employees and the taxpayers. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have good relations now. I don't know. I'm just trying to say that to create an environment for success, we must have good relations. And my way of approaching it as a businessman, as I'm doing here on this program, is to make sure that everybody in town, whether they're in a union or not, especially the taxpayers and the employees, know the state we're in. Know that we haven't grown in the last 10 years. Know that we haven't been able to make ends meet over the last 10 years. Show them what we think we need to do to make them the, this town of success over the next 10 years. Include them in the planning for the next 10 years. Make sure that they're all involved in helping us plan for success. If we don't do that, we will not be a success. We will make it. Now let me give you one, you know, one difference. I'm very happy with American unions in a lot of respects, so I don't want anybody to misinterpret me. But I was sitting in England dealing with the unions, before Maggie Thatcher, before uh, when they were extremely socialistic, I was afraid to buy a house there at the time because I thought they might take it away from me, but uh, so I didn't right away, I did eventually. But Maggie Thatcher came in and started to move things more towards cap, capital, more of a capitalistic way, it's still not, not the way I would like to see it, but it's getting better. If something happened in a factory, or a factory wasn't doing well, or a business wasn't doing well, they would just keep getting money, more money from the government, more money from uh, the state, and they would try to keep going, and uh, nothing would happen, and it'd go on for years that way. And they got in real trouble. Finally, Maggie Thatcher uh, deregulated a lot of companies, sold off a lot of the, the government-owned companies, coal, railroads, computer companies, and I was involved in some of that, and formed ICO, which I was an executive vice president of. And 
while all that was going on, I would look over my shoulder at America. And if, say, the Ford Motor Company or General Motors got in trouble, they would get together with the unions, and within three months, they would close a plant down. And they would then try, you know, to take care of all the employees, of course, that would, might lose their jobs, but then they would try to rebuild the company again so they wouldn't have to close another plant down. So they would really react in, what a, in a more capitalistic manner than some of the countries I've seen and been in and the way they handled their situation. And when I was going to Russia, I used to ask people, before Glasnost, what do you own that's Russian? It would be hard for them to answer. And in the end, of course, Russia went broke. So, and now, they're thriving. <laughs> so, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? So, let me say that the bargaining units are very important and that they are very intelligent and they will deal with us if we include them as part of the team if they're not already and uh, we need to work together they're very important and we need to make sure that everybody realizes that but in the end it's our business and we have to make some tough decisions from time to time it is very important though that we keep our head we stay cool we deal businesslike and we make all our decisions in a businesslike manner with the best interests of all at heart. The next point I want to make here is that Robert's Rules of Order probably should go. It's in the Charter that we need to work on Robert's Rules of Order. Now, the time I've been in the town, I go to a lot of meetings and I go to open meetings and referendums and they're trying to use Robert's Rules of Order and guess what? Nobody knows what Robert's Rules of Order are. I've seen people running the meeting who didn't understand Robert's Rules of Order. I personally don't totally understand Robert's Rules of Order because I've never been in a business in any country that used Robert's Rules of Order. Matter of fact, I've been in a, worked with the government all over America and I've never really seen them use Robert's Rules of Order. Now people say to me, and I've dealt with a lot of states too, and I've never been in a meeting where we use Robert's Rules of Order. Now, when I mention this to people in the town, they say, well, you know, we have elected people, you know, people coming in to open meetings, and how do you control those? Well, in business, <clears throat> you control them with a chairman. The chairperson is responsible for the decorum of the meeting and for how the meeting is controlled. You know, I've been to meetings in our town where policemen are in the audience, you know, because somebody calls and says, hey, we might have a disruption tonight. We'd like to have some policemen here. Now, disruption I've never seen happen yet, but maybe that's because the policemen were there. I don't know. But Robert's Rules of Order, uh, if you're going to have it, then you should follow it. I don't think the select follow Robert's Rules of Order. I went through a whole year here where they were trying to understand Robert's Rules of Order. So somebody should make a decision on Robert's Rules of Order. I personally don't care. If you want to run by Robert's Rules of Order, that's okay. I think it slows things down. And why should we spend a lot of selectmen's time arguing about Robert's Rules of Order when the barn's burning down? Now, earlier in the, in the, uh, um, earlier in the uh, programs, I did talk about bicycle shedding. And maybe I should review that again tonight. How much time do we have left, John? Eight minutes. Okay, I can talk about bicycle shedding. C. Northcote Parkinson, a famous Englishman, wrote a book about Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law is that things expand to fit the space available. If you have a garage and you build a new garage and you want to put your car in there, the next thing you know you're putting your bicycles in there and your, your lawnmowers in there and you're putting in there baby carriages and old pieces of wood and next thing you know you can't put your car in there. That's called um, things expand to fit the space available. That's a rule that everybody in the world knows and they laugh when you talk about it. I have people in my neighborhood who can't put their cars in their garage because it's full of everything else. The next chapter in Mr. Parkinson's book was bicycle shedding. We sit in a board room and somebody comes in and says we want to have a $60 million bond package. And within the space of an hour and a half, 
the whole thing is explained, it's voted on, it's agreed, we change our uh, rules for uh, what's going to be in the, uh, in the budget. As far as the capital, it's now the capital plan, and we do all that, and a couple papers are produced, and the next thing you know, that's out of the way. The next item on the agenda would be, wasn't here, but it would be in Mr. Parkinson's view, let's put a new roof on the bicycle shed out in the backyard. It's chapter two in his book. And then that lasts for eight hours, that discussion. Because everybody knows something about a bicycle shed. One person says, let's put a tower roof on the bicycle shed. They argue about that for 20 minutes. What kind of tower? Where do we get it? How much does it cost? Who's going to do it? And then somebody else says, let's put a glass roof on the bicycle shed. And they argue about that for half an hour. And then somebody else says, let's not have a roof at all on the bicycle shed. And they argue about that for half an hour. And then somebody else says, let's tear down the bicycle shed and build a whole new bicycle shed. And then somebody else says, let's build it two stories high. And they argue about that for half an hour. And this goes on for about eight hours to make a point here. This is called bicycle shedding. And in many companies I've been in, as soon as somebody starts saying bicycle shed, then everybody knows that the, the meeting has gotten out, out of control. Now, one of the bicycle shedding issues we have is Robert's Rules of Order. Surprise, surprise. We talk about that a lot in meetings, and it goes on and on and on. Another one is the cars for the policemen. You know, should they or should they not be getting a, they use them on their personal things when they really have to and when they don't have to? And that goes on for an hour. And I'm not taking a position on any of that. I think uh, it's all resolved now. But if you look at the meetings yourself, I think you'll see less now with the businessmen in because they tend not to bicycle shed. But when, when you have bicycle shedding, that's going on for a lot of time talking about a small issue that doesn't mean beans, right? So I think we should probably take a good look at this. And now with that, I think until they stop me, I'm just going to tell a couple of stories of my granddad, the Sicilian granddad. I made a mistake on my recording. I was so emotional, I cried halfway through there. But uh, I called him an Italian. He's really a Sicilian. He was a Sicilian. I'll just tell you a couple stories. He used to say to my mother, when I, once I got out of school and I started working, he used to say, Brian's a bum. And my mother would say, why is he a bum? And he would say, he's a bum because he keeps moving all the time. Every time he sends me a postcard or a letter, he's in a different place. He doesn't seem to be able to keep a job. Now my granddad, he was in the barber shop all his life, walking around that chair, and he loved it, and he was an expert. He was a top-notch barber. And uh, he just couldn't understand why Brian traveled so much and went. Now, of course, most of the time I was changing locations within the same company, getting promotions and taking on uh, big assignments around the world and, and taking on trouble situations. And uh, he was uh, never quite understood why I was that way. The other story I like to tell about my granddad is when we were little kids, my brother and I were a year and a half apart. We lived about a, a mile away from the barber shop, and we had to have a free haircut every two weeks. And he would say to me, Brian, you needed a haircut. And I say, why? He says, it's been two weeks since you came down for the last haircut. Saturday, you come down for a haircut. We hated to go on Saturday. That was our day off. That's when we played football and baseball in the yard with the kids. We had, so we trudged down to the barber shop. We'd go into the barber shop. And say I had my hair cut first at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday, his busiest day. And by the way, our haircuts were free. I'd get my hair cut, and then we'd be waiting for my brother to get his hair cut so we could go and walk home together. And we'd be in fear of the little bell on the door ringing, meaning somebody paying customer was coming in. So we'd sit there in fear, and sure enough, a little bell rang, and in came another paying customer. The paying customer went ahead of my brother, or me, depending on who got the haircut first. Sometimes we'd be there five hours waiting for paying customers to subside before we could get our final haircut and walk home. That's a story I like to tell. I've told it all over the world. I always tell these stories. That's customer satisfaction for you. Thank you. See you next Tuesday at 9 o'clock.
Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran. This is the 10th program in Planning for Success. Um, what I'm trying to uh, achieve here is to uh, try to show the people in, in the town how to manage the town like a uh, business, like a business. And uh, we've made some progress so far. We have a, lot, a long way to go. So here we go with number 10. In the backdrop tonight, we of course uh, have to think about Thanksgiving. The program will be on today uh, at the time you're watching, 5 o'clock. I recorded a little bit earlier than that. And then it'll be repeated tomorrow night at, 10, at 9 o'clock from 9 to 10, Tuesday night, the 20th of November. And then we will be switching to Friday night, beginning on November 30th at 8 p.m., which I think is probably the best time slot. That's why I chose that. So there are people here who were very cooperative. The chips fell the right way. and, and uh, um, after this week, uh, next Friday, we'll be on at eight, from 8 to 9 p.m. for the 13 weeks. Um, and hopefully afterwards, if we can arrange it with the, with the station. I'd just like to talk a bit about Thanksgiving while I have this nice picture up back of me that I got from the Internet. Um, when I went to Kansas, there were a lot of Indians in Kansas, American Indians, uh, mostly from all over the uh, country. And uh, the, part of the reason for that was that in Lawrence, Kansas, where the university is, was a high school called Haskell. It was an Indian school, and the Indians came from all over the country, mainly Oklahoma and uh, uh, out west type areas, but they came all over to be at Haskell. And one of the uh, graduates of Haskell was the great Billy Mills. Now, when I was in Kansas, Billy Mills was the long distance runner on the, on the uh, United States Championship, uh, college championship track team, coached by Bill Easton. He went down to, to Haskell, he saw Billy Mills, and uh, he picked him up, and Billy Mills ran for the Kansas track team. When I was there, um, I knew Billy, we weren't great friends, but we did know each other, and my wife was friends with, with his wife once he got married. Um, Billy was a uh, Lakota Sioux Indian, grew up on a Sioux reservation in Oklahoma. And um, when I moved into an apartment out of the dorm, I knew Billy when I was in the dorm, when I moved out of the apartment, um, 
into the into uh, out of the dorm into the apartment. And I didn't see much of Billy anymore. And then when I was working down at Navy Tactical Defense System down in Glencoe, Georgia, Joyce and I were living down there for a while. Um, he uh, he was uh, involved with the Marine Corps, and uh, they they uh, had uh, Wes Santee was down there, and he was also from from Kansas. And he pointed out to the Marines that they had a great runner in their midst because Billy had joined the Marine Corps in the early '60s, and uh, they picked up on Billy, and uh, he continued to train. And when we were in Phoenix, Arizona, working at the uh, Air Force uh, uh, Defense uh, uh, System, we saw on TV where Billy won the uh, 10,000 meters in the Olympic uh, Games. So I think it was in Japan. So anyway, I'm very proud of that. Um, there's a movie called Running Brave where you can see that. Now, when I was at Kansas, Billy couldn't get into a fraternity because he was Indian, and uh, that was to my advantage because he couldn't get into the fraternity. He got into the dorm, and we got to know each other, and, uh, and um, he was a very positive influence, uh, very, very good um, de uh, decision-type person and trained very, very hard. So um, I really respect the Indians, the American Indians. Uh, we learned a lot from them. When I first went to England, um, I said, hey, I'd like to have some corn at a restaurant. They said, we don't eat corn in England. That's for the cows. We feed that to the cattle. And I said, well, we learned to eat corn from the American Indians in the, in the east coast of the United States, and we kind of like corn. I think today they eat more corn over there for one reason or another, but uh, I always thought that was an interesting story. So we, have, we learned a lot from the American Indians. They were a great part of our heritage. Uh, and Obviously, the settlers and the uh, and the Indians in the earlier days, at least, got along well together, and they sat down at a dinner table. So, it kind of goes with what I'm trying to achieve here in Winston is getting everybody to sit down and you know talk to each other and work together and try to make this for success. So, everybody, we got our house full on Thanksgiving. I'm sure you do too. Let's have a happy Thanksgiving, and then we'll be back on next week to pursue uh, our objectives. You can now point to the agenda. Christine, thank you. The agenda for tonight, I'll make some comments. They'll be a little longer than usual tonight. Uh, there is a selectman's meeting tonight, and, uh, and this is being uh, on the air before the selectman's meeting, so uh, it won't have any information at all from that meeting. That'll come next week, uh, and I, of course, also have a chance to digest it for a week, so that, that kind of goes well with me. Um, so there'll be comments, and then I'll give a short financial update. Not a lot has happened in the last week or so on that. Then I'll just flash up the major progress status board, the major decision status board, because no major progress or, or, or decisions publicly have been acknowledged uh, during the week. Maybe more will happen tonight at the selectman meeting. But um, so that's just to, just to remind you that we're going to be looking at that every week. I did contact the Democrats to see if they had anything they wanted to put up on this board, and as yet, I don't have um, I don't have uh, anything to add. Uh, but if I do get anything, I will add it to the board, but I wouldn't do it without their, with their permission. Uh, and then I'm going to put up a new slide, which is going to be blank this week, but in the long run, it's going to be the most critical slide of all, and that's going to be call, called instrumentation. And I don't even think I've got it spelled right there, so I for, forgive me for that. Um, uh, but um, it, 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 instrumentation is, is key. And um, one day when I was working in New York on, uh, at... Um, 9X, phone company, one of the ladies that was there for 30 or 40 years when I joined the company said, Brian, if you were an American Indian, they would call you he who flies by instruments. Because I like to fly by instruments. I like to know, you know, where I'm going, you know, how much gas is in the car, how fast is it going, how many miles per hour, etc. So that's called instrumentation. So we, to run our business, we need instrumentation. And we need to keep an eye on that instrumentation at all times and then react when we see the instruments um, diving for zero or something like that. So we do have to take, uh, now as you know, cars today are very well instrumented and they tell you everything. If your little gas door is open, they'll tell you your gas door is open. So almost everything is instrumented on an automobile today and an airplane even more so. So um, we need to do that with the town. So I'm going to just um, introduce that idea today. And then I got a few notices, mainly on the reval, uh, 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 some things about that. And then I'm going to just mention Pearson School shortly. And then most of the time will be spent on expediting the solution, which is the meat of this program tonight.
So now we'll just put this comments thing up so you can see that it is comments. And then if you can point back to me, I'll just talk about the comments. I'm not going to put the comments up on the, on the board tonight. So thank you. Um, well, as far as my comments are concerned, the first thing I want to point out is somebody did let me know this week that uh, it's not a state requirement that we have X number of people on the Board of Education. We can have less if we want to. It's a charter restriction, evidently. So pending somebody proving otherwise, we can change the charter of the Board of Selectmen. I'm, I'm sorry, of the Board of Education and make it smaller and more flexible. I did notice that uh, uh, the Gilbert School was trying in the last X months to to, uh, to streamline their operation a bit up there. And for one reason or another, the, uh, the outside board members didn't agree with them. I wholeheartedly agree with them. I think they should slim that down the way Mr. Cressy wants to do it and make it more effective in a business-like manner. And it'll be a lot easier to run the thing. It'll be a lot... Uh, uh, but more uh, professional and business-like and uh, the instrumentation the information should be flowing anyway whether you have uh, 10 meetings or two and uh, whether you have X number on the uh, on at the meetings or Y number at the meetings that shouldn't affect the flow of information as we're going to talk about for our own town we are now in intensive care we talked a lot about doctors and surgeons before the election and well the businessmen are here and we are now in intensive care we're in intensive care, unfortunately, and, uh, and we will be for four or five years. You know, uh, you, as you know from the sheets I produced on future revenues, we're a long way off from having enough money to do anything. So almost everywhere I go in town, especially in the last few weeks, everywhere I go, uh, when I ask why aren't we implementing these plans, uh, why aren't we doing this or that, it's always money at the root of it all. Now, Brian didn't invent money. Right? Uh, money is the way we do transact things in this in this world, especially in this country. So without money, it's kind of hard to do anything. And everywhere you go, people say, say, well, we can't do anything. We don't have any money. So it's going to take four or five years, as I see it, if all goes well, uh, to be able to have enough money so that we can plan properly and execute properly in a business-like manner. And we're going to have a rough time getting there. Um, and it'll take longer uh, if we don't... Uh, if we if we don't do the right things along the way and we don't manage like a business <clears throat> and just like in an, just like in the intensive care unit we'll need instrumentation to monitor our condition as we progress through intensive care so if you ever been in the intensive care intensive care unit or have gone there to see somebody else you see all kinds of wires you know hooked up uh, my granddaughter first granddaughter was born prematurely I think she was uh, four pounds in one of the best areas to be born prematurely, Houston, Texas, where they have one of the best uh, pr uh, premature uh, labs in the in the country. And when I when I went there to see her when she was born, she was wired up like you wouldn't believe. They had probably 50 wires attached to her one way or another, and monit monitored everything. Now she's uh, one of the tallest girls in her class, and she's quite healthy and. Uh, You'd have never known she was born at, at, at four pounds. But anyway, we need instrumentation. We'll talk quite a bit about that over time. Um, now, I will seek the information necessary for this instrumentation from the town and encourage them to build it into the regular management reporting system. Just like in the intensive care unit, it needs to be there all the time. And you'll hear little beeps and little this and little that. And then when the bell rings, the nurses run in or the doctors run in. And, um, and, and sometimes they have to call an expert and... You know, uh, that's why they call it intensive care. Now, one of the things that's uh, kind of important here is sizing. And uh, sizing is a technique used by all systems people uh, and business people um, in determining uh, what is capable, what things are capable of. Now, I think the simplest example I can give you is a pipe. If you have a three-inch pipe and it's five feet long, uh, or no matter how long it is, you can only pump so much water through that pipe. And you can only pump so fast. If you try to pump more water through the pipe, then uh, it, then it will hold. It'll back up in the front, and you won't get it in the pipe. Uh, you can only apply so much pressure to the pipe because all pipes are pressure related. And if you put too much pressure on, um, it won't. Uh, you know, it might break. So um, so everything has to be sized that way. Our town is no different. No different than that. Uh, we have to find out how much future current and future capacity that we have available for additions to the town and where the bottlenecks are likely to occur. Now, right now, um, there are a lot of things that don't appear to be a bottleneck whatsoever, and, you know, of course, that doesn't mean infinite uh, 
Uh, but water and sewer tend to be pretty well uh, underutilized, and we do have plenty of uh, capacity, from what I hear from expert testimony at these meetings I go to. So we're a, uh, we're a little way away from having to, uh, to worry about that. On the other hand, the schools, that's another question. So what we need to do with the schools is uh, try to get some instrumentation, find out whether we're, how we're sized, um, and then um, I'll go from there. The sizing, once complete and kept up to date, can be used to regulate and balance the approval of new additions to the town as permits are requested. Now, this is not new for the town. We already do do that. So we have 95% uh, of the time, most people can come in and they can apply for permits and, and, and one way or another get through the system. It's that 5% that causes all the interesting questions and all the controversy. So um, that's, that's a 95% rule. We'll talk about that later on. I might not get to it today, but it is part of this uh, part of this section of the programs. Uh, completing the sizing is not an easy exercise and will take a lot of time, a lot of time, probably a year or two, to be able to uh, size, uh, get the, the town size the way we want it, make sure it's in sync with the with the state and, uh, and the needs of the people in town. There's a process that has to be go gone through. That'll take time. In the meantime, we must use what we have coupled. Uh, with the uncommon common sense. We do have a plan now for this and um, and people are using that uh, until future until it's changed in the future. Some uh, residents of the town have or I've already put out a, a call for statistics on the school system from almost everybody I can think of and um, and uh, I've got a lot of information back from a lot of people and uh, where to go and look for things and where to get the statistics uh, from websites to other places and uh, I will be doing that. It's going to take quite a bit of time though because I have to squeeze it in uh, between other things but I don't think there's any big rush for it but I do think once we get all the statistics out then you know, nobody can argue. I mean the facts will be there and we can all say just like I did with my state of the town statistics we'll be able to see the state of the of the town and the schools very clearly and then we can make decisions based upon that. Right now, there's a lot of information floating around. My view is it's not coordinated and it's not uh, presented in a way that the ordinary taxpayers and citizens can understand the correct problem. If you can't understand the problem, you'll always be arguing about the solution. Financial update. Uh, switch to the financial up. Thank you. The financial update is kind of simple this week. The bond restructure. There's no new news. I was. I did tell you last week. I would try to find out when the Pearson School uh, had to be finished uh, because of the complaint with the state. Um, I did not get that information this week. Uh, I couldn't reach the right people. I'm going to see some school people tomorrow, so I think I'll be able to get it for the next show. It's not really, uh, really, really not critical. Uh, it is critical for the selectmen because they are putting together the plan uh, to fix that, uh, uh, those problems, and get them done in time so that we won't have any repercussions from the state. So that, I guess the selectmen are moving on that. As soon as they supply some information, maybe something will come out tonight at the uh, selectmen meeting, then I'll post it here. Reevaluation is still expected in early December. We're only a few weeks away from that now. You will be getting a letter in your mailbox around the beginning of uh, uh, December telling you what your new value is on your property. I will talk about that on a, in a few more minutes. Um, the 208-09 budget expected around June 208 and by then we'll have all, we should have at least two pieces of the puzzle. We'll know revaluation, we'll know the budget and then we just have to see how the, the uh, bond uh, issues um, um, settle down and how, what kind of a plan is put together for fixing the problems that we, we thought uh, were pointed out in the bond issue. Now, instrumentation. This is, I'm just putting this up prematurely now. It may never ever come to this. We may not have this in the end. Uh, but I gave out three uh, different spreadsheets and uh, with a statement of the problem that the town is uh, over the last 10 years hasn't been earning any money. It's been breaking even, if not losing a bit. And we haven't been able to keep up with the needs of the town. 
So what I did was I put a, the, together a spreadsheet that showed over the next 15 or 16 years, if we took the 3.52% average growth that we get from taxes now mainly, um, uh, and kept that for 10 more years, you know, we'd still have zero savings. Then I also put together a spreadsheet which said, hey, if we can grow that 3.52 to 6% over the next four or five or six years, then we'll have some savings and we'll be able to do things and plan things and we'll be more proactive and we can get some of these plans that are on the shelves, off the shelves, and start working on them. And uh, there are plenty of plans in town. Uh, one, of the, one of the planning um, uh, per people told me that there's at least seven or eight plans for, for development and redevelopment that are sitting gathering dust because there's no money to implement them. And I think the town, as somebody told me in the town hall, that there's roughly 30 plans sitting around. And, you know, uh, plans aren't the problem. The money to implement those plans is the problem. And I think almost everybody agrees with that. At least I haven't found anybody who doesn't yet. And then uh, I left here on this chart, I left a question mark because the selectmen may choose not to pick my 6% that I had, and it's, that's their decision how they do this. They, they may choose not to do any of these, and that's their decision. But uh, once I know what their plan is, then I'll replace these three with whatever their plan is, and we'll, and we'll look at it, and we'll, we'll watch it every week and every month and every quarter for the next four or five years, you know, to see, as long as I'm here anyway, to see how it progresses. Um, the third one I put together was for the Grand Leap. That's getting something similar to the development into town that gives us a big jump in the tax base, as well as the growth from 3.52 to question mark percent. And uh, I use six in my spreadsheet. Now I do have a copy of the spreadsheets. You can flash over to me for a second. John? Well, I don't know. He's not flashing over, so I'll put it up here. Okay, that's all right. That's okay, John. I got it. Um, here it is. This is uh, um, in here. I have uh, this is actually not the right one, but anyway, I've got the plan. It's uh, three. Uh, it's a statement of the problem, and it's three objective um, uh, spreadsheets that I made that will be updated from time to time. If any of those are adopted, we'll follow the progress. If not, the selectmen will do their own spreadsheet or their own approach to growing the town revenue, which is one of their first priorities, and then we'll follow that. So this is going to be a long, slow process, so I don't expect to see much on this chart for a while, but I do want to make, put it up here and let you know that we haven't forgotten it, and it's one of the key things we have to do. That's the instrumentation. That's going to tell us where we stand. We have the major status report, which is uh, there. Yeah, it hasn't changed since last time, so I'm not going to dwell on it. We still have the uh, important decisions sheet, and uh, that hasn't changed since last time, so um, I'm not going to dwell on that. And I'm going to get on to now uh, a bit about, just a bit about the Pearson School. Um, and... Uh, first, I wanted to talk a bit about vision appraisal. Let's talk first about vision appraisal, and that is the um, uh, next, in the beginning of December, um, we are going to get our revaluation results. Now, these revaluation results may be appealed. Every one of you can appeal your revaluation re result, and I would encourage you to, to uh to look into it. When you get your notice, there will be a number on there for you to call. And I think it's going to be the town library, although I'm not positive about that. It'll be somewhere. And it probably won't be the assessor's office because they have to carry on with normal business. So you can call that number and you can get a copy of your vision appraisal sheet. I've got, got one today of mine from, the, from my property. And th this is all the facts about your piece of property. And uh, when you get this, it'll tell you everything they have on here is part of what they use to make up your taxes. So, and it also has a picture on it of your house. So um, usually they only have one sheet. I happen to have two because they've got a complex piece of property. But if you get this, then you should check it over and make sure they got the right number of bathrooms, the right, right number of bedrooms, the right square footage. Uh, you don't have two lots instead of one. There are some problems that happen. I have gone down and reviewed things for people down the last reappraisal, and they, they were uh, inaccurate in some of these sheets. In general, they're accurate. But, you know, 95% of the time, they'll be accurate. 
probably 5% of the time, there'll be a mistake for one reason or another, and you should make sure that you're not in that 5%. So you'll get your revaluation, you'll call the number that's there, and then you'll get you'll go down and you'll get a copy of your, appra- your new appraisal that's there. Don't call now because they're only a few weeks away from getting the appraisals done, and we want them to concentrate on that. And then once you get that, uh, you can check all the details for accuracies and inaccuracies and point those out to the people that, hey, that you don't have the right information on there. And I know one person was being being charged for two lots when he only had one. So uh, you have to look out for that. Um, then the next step will be, once you get the phone number and, uh, and, and you look at it, and you, then you report any errors. Um, and then if, if they're not fixed, then you can appeal a second step, and that's to the Board of Assessment Appeals in the town of Winchester. This is a Board of Assessment Appeals. So once you get through the first stage, you've called, you've pointed out your problems, they haven't been fixed, then you go to the Board of Assessment Appeals. If the board, board of Assessment Appeals will hear your case within a certain number of uh, days, and then um, you either will have, they will agree with you that there's some mistakes and they'll fix them, and that may or may not affect your, your taxes. And then, um, but if they, if they don't agree with you, then you still have another step, and that is to take legal action. Um, I'm not suggesting you take legal action. I'm just saying that's the next step after the Board of Assessment Appeals. Um, you have to then go uh, in, into the civil process. Now, I want to make a very strong point to you here that, and people have been caught up in this in the past, they wanted to, uh, to take legal action, but they hadn't gone through the appeal process properly. And if the appeal process is not followed, then legal action may not be possible. So. Um, you want to make sure you understand exactly what that process is if you have any questions so that you follow it from day one in case you either want to uh, do something illegal or a legal uh, case or you want to join a class action suit or anything like that. Um, Okay, now the only thing I want to point out about the Pearson School is that the Pearson School, uh, the, the two things we're dealing with now and uh, selectmen are going to be dealing with first are the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act, ADA, um, and you can go to the ADA.gov on the internet uh, if you want more information about them and those violations. They've point, been pointed out to us. And uh, what they do, the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, uh, they re- they're, they're the regulations for businesses and state and local governments for dealing with people with disabilities. And you must have certain things if you are, um, you know, a state or a, or like a city town like us, and you have schools and things like that, public places. You must have certain safety features, um, and uh, for people with disabilities. And we have some violations there that need to be fixed. Um, there's no question about it; they need to be fixed. So, <coughs> it's a question of planning it and doing it and funding it. The next is uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. That's called OSHA. That's www.osha.gov. And if you want any more information about that, you go there. But their mission is to prevent injuries and protect the health of America's workers by ensuring safe and healthful workplaces. So when you go into the town halls and the schools, and you know, the, the workmen need to be protected as well. So, uh, so we have a combination of both those. and. Uh, um, we need to get, we have violations that need to be fixed, and um, we have potential violations that probably haven't been pointed out yet, but uh, that also may need to be fixed over time, and that's where all this planning needs to, to, to happen. So Now I'm going to switch to, for the last half hour, I'm going to talk about what I wanted to talk about tonight, and that's the beginning of expediting the solution, because when you're in intensive care, you want some fast service by the best people. You don't say, send me the worst doctor and don't give me fast service when you go into um, intensive care in a hospital. Matter of fact, your relatives will be there saying, get that person the best care you can and um, let's hurry up and get them well and out of the intensive care area. So um, we need now to uh, look at this and the first thing I want to point out to you is that the Board of Selectmen, if you read the charter, and you can get a copy of the charter at the town hall, we can switch to the uh, um, 
for the board now, John. Uh, you can get a copy of the charter at the town hall, and um, we'll be using the, the thing now, uh, Christine, for quite a while, so we'll just leave it there for now. Um, the policy is what the selectmen, these, that we, these experienced businessmen that we voted into office, that's uh, what they're there to do. They're there to create the policy for the town and to change the policy or correct the policy or whatever they have to do to be able to run like a business. And that's stated in the charter. That's their responsibility. So what I did was, and everybody always asks you a lot of questions, well, what's policy mean? So I went to the dictionary down at the university library and I got us the definition of policy um, from the Random House Dictionary of the English Language, second edition, unabridged. So if you have any argument with this definition, don't argue with me. Argue with the dictionary and whoever made that dictionary down there. But anyway, everybody argues about everything, you know. That's why I have to hedge all these things when I talk. Um, anyway, definition of policy is a definite course of action. Definite course of action. It says nothing about wishy-washy. Definite course of action adopted for the sake of expediency. It doesn't say adopted for the sake of slowness. It says op adopted for the sake of expediency, facility, etc. So I'll just read it all to you. A definite course of action adopted for the sake of expediency, facility, etc. And an example they give in a dictionary is we have a new company policy. So you can, can expect over the next six months lots of new, and I hope quicker, lots of either amended company policies or new company policies. Um, a lot of the company policies we have now probably be quite all right, but they need to be reviewed, they need to be updated, and, they, and we need to add where necessary and subtract where necessary. The second thing is it says it's a course of action pursued by a government, ruler, political party, etc. Well, we're, we're a business, but we're also the government of the town of Winchester, so it applies to us. And it says, our nation's foreign policy. Here we would say our town's policy. Right? So, and now, it's synonymous with strategy, principle, and rule. That comes right from the dictionary. So it's kind of strategic. It's strategic stuff, principle and rule. There's not much room for uh, arguing about minute detail here. And uh, uh, as one of the Republicans said in, in, in his running for office uh, on TV, we don't want to sit all night and argue with the lawyers about the definition of is. So uh, that's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. So that's what policy is all about, and that's what the selectmen are here to do, and that's what they'll do. So um, what I want to put up now are my just what I'm going to cover. I won't get it all done tonight. I only got a half an hour, and I could talk about this for months. But um, ex expediting the solution is... Uh, consists of a lot of things. I don't have them all on here, but I'll give you an idea and kind of the order I picked to go through them for our town if it was a different system or, or, or organization or, or company I was, I was talking to, uh, and I've talked to all sorts, I'd probably change the priorities a little bit. But ours is definitely to get the policy right and make sure it's agreed and it's implemented. And uh, I don't want to talk too much about policy, but uh, um, we know what we need to do and uh, we need to do it. Now, non-policy decisions, um, that's to be delegated. That's to be delegated to the town manager and all his line management. All the management that work for the town manager and all the people that work for them, and then all the consultants they use and anybody involved with any town business uh, will work on the non-policy issues. Now, when they're delegated, providing the people, town manager and the town people and the consultants and everybody involved follows the policy, then the selectmen shouldn't be dipping down in there micromanaging the non-policy area. They need a good, strong town manager. They need to give him the muscle to be able to do the job, and they need to give him the authority, and we'll talk a bit about that here. But that's very important. So. Um, uh, I won't dwell on each one of these now because I'm going to go into each one in, in, in uh, detail. But anyway, we've got policy, non-policy, visibility, feedback, parallel activities, line management, staff relationships, responsibility, accountability, empowerment, decision making, the 95% rule, results, of orienta uh, results orientation, incentives, the use of committees, 
and the non-use of committees, management by objectives, management by exception, planning. There's a whole more that I'll probably be adding from week to week, and especially if somebody calls and wants to talk about any particular one, but there's management, uh, a lot of management things that are involved that I don't have on this list. But now, to some people, this will be second nature uh, in town if they run businesses and they have business backgrounds or they have business school backgrounds. Um, but to the majority of people in town, this will not be second nature, so that's why I'm taking the time uh, to do this program and to talk to everybody about it. So we'll start out with the first one on the list, which is policy. Um, and I just want to synchronize my papers here. So, All right. The Board of Selectmen should deal with policy, planning, and decision-making only. That's very simple. There's not much more to say about it. Uh, preferably, they should make sure that the policies are written down um, and that they're uh, available to all in town. Anybody who wants to see what they are, if you don't know what the policies are, you can't implement them. Very difficult. And uh, they should make sure that they help educate people as to what the policies are. Talk to people. Go to go talk to people and explain the policies and answer questions about the policies. So that's very very important. And then. Um, it, then everybody will know, and it, hopefully they'll be in a little binder with the uh, written policy on it, and then we'll know what the policy of the town is. Um, the next point is non-policy decision. The Board of Selectmen should delegate all non-policy planning and decision-making to the town manager. <coughs> oh, pardon me, I still have my cold, as you can see, and his direct reports. They, too, should delegate more practically to their people and to any uh, subcontractors or any um, any consultants or anybody who works to help us resolve these issues with the town. Now, once things get down in the non-policy area, uh, the town manager shouldn't have to run to the town every week with a report that talks about these non-policy issues. He should only bring to the selectmen those, those things where he wants redefinition or reinforcement of what the policies are or clarification of the policies. Meanwhile, you should get on and do the other stuff. And right now, from what I have seen in the past, and maybe my eyes have deceived me a bit, but we deal more with the non-policy decisions at these selectmen meetings in the past than we have with the policy decisions. So I'm very concerned about that, and I'm hoping that we can, and I'm positive that the businessmen will take this approach uh, uh, because they do it all the time in their businesses and it comes second nature to them. Um, the third thing I want to mention is once you get this, you need to make it visible to everybody. It's like the Constitution of the United States of America. Anybody can get a copy of it. The Bill of Rights, anybody can get a copy of it. Almost anything that's important like that, you can get a copy of. So. And it's important for people to get it, talk about it, understand it, and then use it as a tool to implement uh, their uh, the, you know, daily business uh, throughout the town. So I want to put up my next slide here. Switch to Christine again. Uh, John, thank you. Um, I'm going to blow my nose, so I don't really want to do that on camera. All policies, objectives, and plans should be published widely for all to see, comment upon, and provide input to the originators. So one of the things when you're trying to get things done rapidly is you need feedback. You need people to tell you um, and question things and tell you where they think you might either improve these policies or that you might be mistaken and you might not have all the information you needed to make this decision for these policies. So people who do that should be wide awake, always looking for input. And, and that input can come from anybody. I mean, you'd be surprised how, what kind of people will give you very, very valuable information uh, when you're trying to do things. It might even be anonymous calls. You know, it doesn't matter. You just take the information. And in mathematics, we have a thing called the, the absolute value of and um, I'll draw a little picture quickly with my black pen I bought for this purpose. And uh, the absolute value of A is denoted like this in mathematics. And it means that's the absolute value of A. 
And whenever I look at anything, I not, when I ask other people, like, please look at the absolute value of things. Um, if there are plus A plus and there's A minus, and what we're really interested in is A. And uh, let's keep our eye on the ball. Now, we want people to tell us what they think the pluses and minuses are, but we don't want to uh, get carried away with um, uh, changing things uh, and make that into a B. Right? So uh, it's the absolute value of. So you'll hear me talk a lot about the absolute value of things, and that's what I'll be referring to. So all the policies and objectives should be published widely for all to see. Let's look for comment. Let's go out there and find out what people think of these things, and then let's correct them where, and improve them where we can. And, uh, and mechanisms can be set up for that. Like, uh, just like I set up on my program an email address in a mailbox and say, please send me um, information, and then if I have wrong information, I'll correct it. And uh, if you have new information for me, I'll, but I would say to people, uh, please stop sending me camels. I'm getting a lot of camels in the mail, and I'm giving them away, but I don't need any more camels. I made that comment about committees produce camels. Since then, people have been having a lot of fun with it. But... Uh, Thank you very much, but don't send them anymore. Um, the next is feedback. That's very important. Feedback. Good people look for feedback. Any of the great athletes I knew always had managers on hand all the time giving them feedback. You try this, try that, run this way, point your feet that way, do this, do that. And they were very reliant upon that feedback. Good everybody is relying upon feedback. Feedback is Darwinian. Feedback is what helps keep you, um, keep you going in the right direction. And sometimes it's hard to get people's attention when you're in the management business. And one of the points I always like to say is, I could go out and tell everybody they're going to freeze to death in the winter if they don't buy a coat. Or if they go to Alaska, you better buy a coat. And uh, I was with a company when I went to Russia, they bought me a coat, big, nice, big uh, fur coat, because they knew it was, was going to be colder in Russia than I would have ever figured. Now, nobody ever listens to you when you tell them to buy a coat. What happens is, on the day they freeze, they run down to buy the coat. And uh, usually by then, it's too late. So um, we got to, as managers, keep our ears open and our eyes open, and, and we have to be uh, able to accept feedback. And I haven't seen much of that around in the last uh, five or six years. I think that's one of our biggest weaknesses, that we, we tend to, uh, to uh, discourage people from feeding back. Um, parallel activities. This is very difficult for some people to understand, but it's very important to do things in parallel. You, it's not, not really, as a manager of a business, it's not good to just do one thing and try to do it right and spend all your time on that. You have to get as many things going in parallel as possible and practical and, and start everybody looking at that and working on that. And to a certain extent, that's a, a part of system thinking, which is uh, something I'll talk about in later shows. But... Um, it's best to get a many things going. So now we have seven selectmen. If we had 35 issues, we could give each of them five, and we could say, okay, you be the godfather or godmother for those five and get them moving. Or you could say, okay, you be the godmother or godfather for 10, and then you can do 70 in parallel. So the important thing is to get everything moving. That's how you move fast. That's how you expedite the solution. You must be able to work in parallel uh, and uh, things. Now, I'll tell you, one, one of the places I, I learned how to work in parallel. When I was in high school, I worked at the Conley Inn Coffee Shop down in Torrington, Connecticut. No longer, it's no longer there, but it was a nice coffee shop, and one summer I worked in there, and there was a guy at the, uh, at the uh, grill, and his name was Steve. I don't know his last name. He was a grouchy guy, but uh, I didn't know his last name, but he was the best short order cook I ever saw in my life. And what happened was, at busy time of day, which was noon, in those days Torrington was bustling at noon, everybody would come in, and they, there were probably eight waitresses there, certainly six or seven, and they would shout orders at Steve. 
And Steve would remember every single order without even looking at the waitress. He was frying eggs and making sandwiches and doing things with the grill. And, but he remembered everything, and he never goofed up an order. He was always right. Often he would give an order to a waitress, and he said, wait a minute, that's not what I ordered. And he said, yes, you did, and in the end, he proved to be right. So um, and then when there were slow days, he would say, Brian, why don't you try this? I thought he was crazy, but I tried it, and, and I began to develop an ability to keep several things going in my mind at the same time that weren't written down, and then I could progress with all these orders. Now, I couldn't do 50 like he could, but I could do 10. And uh, then pretty soon I could do 15. And then I found when I went out into the business world, when the higher you get in an organization, say selectman level or town manager level, it's very important that you be able to handle many, many, many things in parallel and, and be able to switch from one to the other without skipping a beat. So. I, I can't dwell enough on this. Uh, there, there's training that's required. There's, uh, there's a lot of understanding that's required. But it's parallel, parallel working is absolutely critical uh, if we're going to be able to get this thing resolved in a relatively short period of time, meaning three, four, five years. All right. The next point I want to make is that, and this is mainly for definition, this is, most people will know what this is, but for those who don't, we have line management. The line management below the selectmen, they're the executives. The line management um, are the people who implement the policies and do all the non-policy work and feedback on the policy and suggest new policies. They can do all that. Uh, but their main job is to get on with it and do everything within the policies and get things going and not have to keep running back asking uh, for, um, can I do this, can I do that, is it okay if I do this, is it okay if I do that? they got to get on with it. They're supposed to be professionals. They know their job better than anybody else, even better than a selectman in a lot of cases. I did misspell the word here. apologize for that. So the town manager, his direct reports, and their direct reports on down. That's the line management. So whenever I talk about line management, that's what I'll be talking about. Now the staff, these are the personnel that are there to assist the line managers and usually have some particular expertise that is very important. Uh, and usually a staff relationship is the financial, the personnel, the um, uh, all the um, uh, um, ladies that help with the minutes and help with arrange the, the manager's time and, um, and all that. So there's plenty of people there and they're also very important. But they're the people that assist the line managers so they can do things faster, so they can be more effective. And, you know, I got to the point with one little company I had in California where all the vice presidents were sitting on the computer typing their own letters. And I would say to them, hey, that's not for you to do. What you need to do is get out and sell the product or build the product and, you know, help us grow this company. But, you know, getting on the computer uh, is a bit like sticking your thumb in your mouth, you know, sucking your thumb. So it's easier than going out and selling the product. It's easier than actually doing the solution. So we have to make sure we have the staff people to help us take that burden away from us. And there is a tendency in the business world now to get away from that and to load too many small, um, non-critical issues onto the line managers. And what we're going to try to do, or I'm going to try to suggest we do, is get them out of that and get let other people that are better at doing it uh, to do that so they can concentrate on getting us through. Now the next point I would like to make is responsibility and accountability. Or, or am I, where am I now? Yeah, responsibility and accountability. Responsibility is fertilizer. Think of it as fertilizer. If you give people responsibility, they will grow. They will learn by doing things, by having responsibility and making decisions, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So responsibility is good. Now, not, not all people want responsibility. Um, and I, I was told by Phil Fellows, I mentioned his name last week on my program, who taught me an awful lot when I was first in the business. He worked for Eddie Rickenbacker of uh, 
Eastern Airlines, and they put in one of the first big computer systems in the world uh, at Eastern Airlines in Charlotte, North Carolina. <clears throat> he told me, Brian, if you go out and you accept responsibility, people will give you responsibility because they don't want the responsibility. So just go out, and if you go out around the world and you see things, make a decision. You don't have to go back to the headquarters and, you know, and oh, just get out there and make decisions. The hardest thing it is to find when you run a business is people who will accept responsibility and make decisions and get on with things. Now, it also helps, of course, if you make the, resp the decisions and accept the responsibility within the policy direction. And I often say that I, uh, at times I had an engineer working for me that was an expert. And I wasn't an expert engineer. And I had a software development expert working for me, and I wasn't a software development expert. But wherever I went, I took those people on my contract with me. And they could be in any part of the world. And they could run into any kind of a problem. And they would know what each other was thinking, what the policy was, what the non-policy approaches that we preferred were, and they could make decisions and accept responsibility. And 95% of the time, they would have made the same decision I would have made. And of course, working together for a while speeds things up because you know how people think. Right. Um, so I want to point out that responsibility is good, it's a fertilizer, and you, you know, it will help us if people will accept responsibility. Now, if they don't want to accept responsibility, then they got a problem because this is going to be in a, in a, a town that for a while there will be a lot of responsibility delegated to people, and it's all very important stuff that has to be done, so we have to make sure that people do it. Now, coupled with responsibility comes accountability. And accountability is um, a thing that people are afraid of because if they accept responsibility and then they have to accept accountability, then they, they want, we want to make sure that whenever they do something responsible and if they make a mistake, that we don't hang them, we don't beat them up. You know? Now, I did use the example once on this program of, um, of the modern day basketball and that uh, I, I, they make 30, 40 mistakes a game, the best players in the game. And uh, they're not taken out of the game. Sometimes they are, but usually they're not. And they get on and they score 120 points and either win or lose the game. But there's much more tolerance today for excellent people making mistakes than there ever was when I was, when I was younger. So we as managers have to realize that people make mistakes and they're not always going to make the right decision. Then you try to correct it. And then, of course, if they make the re wrong decision every time, then you've got a different problem on your hand. So, um, but most people are pretty intelligent, and if you explain things to them, uh, they will, will manage. Now, we don't have much time here um, today, so um, I guess we've got about five minutes left. We will go on with a lot more of these things uh, from, from next week and the following weeks. But I think I have time for one more, and that's empowerment. We need to empower people to make these decisions, accept this responsibility, be accountable. We have to give them the chance to do the job. And then we have to provide them with the air cover, I call it, help them. If they're around the world or somewhere in town and they need help, they should be able to get you on the phone and, uh, or come to your office or do whatever and, and get help. So um, they will need help. They'll need an awful lot of help. So we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to give it to them and we need to do it in a positive manner, and, uh, and we need to develop people and uh, get on. Now, next week when we come back, which uh, the, this, the same program will be on tomorrow night. Now, if I'm in tomorrow night now, let's switch to tomorrow night. Um, I won't, uh, I'm, I'm recording this program before tonight's selectman meeting, so this program doesn't have anything to do with what's going to be on tonight. Monday selectman meeting. So when you, if you're seeing it on Tuesday night, then uh, take it for what it's worth. And, um, and then next week when we have it, I'll record it after this selectman meeting. And in future, I'll record it after the selectman meetings. 
and uh, and I should have, be able to provide more real-time type information. But this information, no matter what happens at any select meeting, this is still very important. Um, I might have time to cover decision making. If I don't, uh, and he cuts me off, then I'll, I'll redo it next time. But decision making is critical. It's very important to make a decision than not to make a decision. And uh, when you make the decision, it should be in line with the policies and with all the non-policy uh, um, uh, rules and regulations that we have to follow the policy. And, but decision making is very important. So I always tell people that when I make decisions, I'm going to be a bit like Ted Williams, and I'm from the Ted Williams era, not from the modern. I don't even know who the modern players are, but he only batted 400, maybe 430. He didn't bat 1,000. So it's very difficult to make decisions that are correct all the time. So fear of making the wrong decision should not stop people from making decisions. People should be encouraged to make decisions. The environment should encourage decision making, not procrastination. And things like, let's pass it off for the town body to, uh, to uh, agree. It's more procrastination when you know the thing isn't right in the first place to even go to the town meeting. So what I'm saying here is, let's, let's step up to the plate as businessmen. Let's make the decisions and not, uh, and not try to procrastinate. It is impossible to make correct decisions every time, no matter how much you deliberate. You can sit and talk about an issue, but in the next day you'll find some piece of information that changes your whole, it changes your mind if you're open and objective about it. So once a decision is made, the decision maker should always be on the lookout to correct their decision if facts prove this advisable. And if you have any question about that, read A Study in Scarlet by Arthur Conan Doyle. That's the first in the Sherlock Holmes series. And he, t he tells you how he approaches problem solving. And I think you can learn a lot from that. With that, I think that's the end of our program for this evening. Uh, next week we'll start, maybe we'll rehash a little of this, but we'll start with whatever happened at the select meeting tonight and uh, bring you up to date on that, update all our charts and things. And then we will talk about more uh, about expediting solution, and we'll start out with the 95% rule and progress from there. With that, I thank you very much.